Book One of the Meditations of the Emperor Marcus Aurelius Antoninus. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Meditations of the Emperor Marcus Aurelius Antoninus by Marcus Aurelius. Translated by George Crystal. 1888 through 1944. Book One. I learned from my grandfather, Virus, to use good manners and to put restraint on anger. In the famous memory of my father, I had a pattern of modesty and manliness. Of my mother, I learned to be pious and generous, to keep myself not only from evil deeds, but even from evil thoughts, and to live with a simplicity which is far from customary among the rich. I owe it to my great-grandfather that I did not attend public lectures and discussions, but had good and able teachers at home, and I owe him also the knowledge that for things of this nature a man should count no expense too great. My tutor taught me not to favor either green or blue at the chariot races, nor in the contests of gladiators to be a supporter either of light or heavy-armed. He taught me also to endure labor, not to need many things, to serve myself without troubling others, not to intermeddle in the affairs of others, and not easily to listen to slanders against them. Of Diognetus I had the lesson not to busy myself about vain things, not to credit the great professions of such as pretend to work wonders, or of sorcerers about their charms and their expelling of demons and the like not to keep quails for fighting or divination nor to run after such things to suffer freedom of speech in others and to apply myself heartily to philosophy him also i must thank for my hearing first bacchus then tindasus and marcianus that I wrote dialogues in my youth, and took a liking to the philosopher's palate and skins, and to the other things which by the Grecian discipline belong to that profession. To Rusticus I owe my first apprehensions that my nature needed reform and cure, and that I did not fall into the ambition of the common sophists either by composing speculative writings or by declaiming harangues of exhortation in public. Further, that I never strove to be admired by ostentation of great patience in an aesthetic life, or by display of activity and application, that I gave over the study of rhetoric, poetry, and the graces of language, and that I did not pace my house in the senatorial robes or practice any similar affectation. I observed also the simplicity of style in his letters, particularly in that which he wrote to my mother from Sinuesa. I learned from him to be easily appeased, and to be readily reconciled with those who had displeased me, or given cause of offense so soon as they inclined to make their peace, to read with care, not to rest satisfied with a slight and superficial knowledge, nor quickly to assent to great talkers. I have him to thank that I met with the discourses of Epictetus, which he furnished me from his own library. From Apollonius I learned true liberty, and tenacity of purpose, to regard nothing else even in the smallest degree, but reason always, and always to remain unaltered in the agonies of pain, in the losses of children, or in long diseases. He afforded me 
a living example of how the same man can upon occasion be most yielding and most inflexible he was patient in exposition and as might well be seen esteemed his fine skill and ability in teaching others the principles of philosophy as the least of his endowments it was from him that i learned how to receive from friends what are thought favors without seeming humbled by the giver or insensible to the gift sextus was my pattern of a benign temper and his family the model of a household governed by true paternal affection and a steadfast purpose of living according to nature here i could learn to be grave without affectation to observe sagaciously the several dispositions and inclinations of my friends to tolerate the ignorant and those who follow current opinions without examination his conversation showed how a man may accommodate himself to all men and to all companies for though companionship with him was sweeter and more pleasing than any sort of flattery yet he was at the same time highly respected and reverenced no man was ever more happy than he in comprehending finding out and arranging in exact order the great maxims necessary for the conduct of life his example taught me to suppress even the least appearance of anger or any other passion but still with all this perfect tranquillity to possess the tenderest and most affectionate heart to be apt to approve others yet without noise to have much learning and little ostentation i learned from alexander the grammarian to avoid censuring others to refrain from flouting them for a barbarism solecism or any false pronunciation rather was i dexterously to pronounce the words rightly in my answer confining approval or objection to the matter itself and avoiding discussion of the expression or to use some other form of courteous suggestion fronto made me sensible how much of envy deceit and hypocrisy surrounds princes and that generally those whom we account nobly born have somehow less natural affection i learned from alexander the platonist not often nor without great necessity to say or write to any man in a letter that i am not at leisure nor thus under pretext of urgent affairs to make a practice of excusing myself from the duties which according to our various ties we owe to those with whom we live of catullus i learned not to condemn any friend's expostulation even though it were unjust but to try to recall him to his former disposition to stint no praise in speaking of my masters as is recounted of demetius and athenodorus and to love my children with true affection of severus my brother i learned to love my kinsmen to love truth to love justice through him i came to know thrasia helvidius cato dion and brutus he gave me my first conception of a commonwealth founded upon equitable laws and administered with equality of right and of a monarchy whose chief concern is the freedom of its subjects of him i learned likewise a constant and harmonious devotion to philosophy to be ready to do good to be generous with all my heart he taught me to be of good hope and trustful of the affection of my friends i observed in him candor in declaring what he condemned in the conduct of others and so frank and open was his behavior that his friends might easily see without the trouble of conjecture what he liked or disliked 
The counsels of Maximus taught me to command myself, to judge clearly, to be of good courage in sickness and other misfortunes, to be moderate, gentle, yet serious in disposition, and to accomplish my appointed task without repining. All men believed that he spoke as he thought, and whatever he did, they knew it was done with good intent. I never found him surprised or astonished at anything. He was never in a hurry, never shrank from his purpose, was never at a loss or dejected. He was no facile smiler, but neither was he passionate or suspicious. He was ready to do good, to forgive, and to speak the truth, and gave the impression of unperverted rectitude rather than of a reformed character. No man could ever think himself despised by Maximus, and no one ever ventured to think himself his superior. He had also a good gift of humor. I learned from my father gentleness and undeviating constancy in judgments, formed after due reflection, not to be puffed up with glory as men understand it, to be laborious and assiduous. He taught me to give ready hearing to any man who offered anything tending to the common good, to meet out impartial justice to every one, to apprehend rightly when severity and when clemency should be used, to abstain from all impure lusts, and to use humanity towards all men. Thus he left his friends at liberty to sup with him or not, to go abroad with him or not, exactly as they inclined and they found him still the same if some urgent business had prevented them from obeying his commands. I learned of him accuracy and patience in counsel, for he never quitted an inquiry satisfied with first impressions. I observed his zeal to retain his friends without being fickle or over-fond, his contentment in every condition, his cheerfulness, his forethought about very distant events, his unostentatious attention to the smallest details, his restraint of all popular applause and flattery, ever watchful of the needs of the empire, a careful steward of the public revenue, he was tolerant of the censure of others in affairs of that kind. He was neither a superstitious worshipper of the gods, nor an ambitious pleaser of men, nor studious of popularity, but in all things sober and steadfast, well skilled in what was honorable, never affecting novelties. As to the things which make the ease of life, and which fortune can supply in such abundance, he used them without pride, and yet with all freedom, enjoyed them without affectation when they were present, and when absent he found no want of them. No man could call him sophist, buffoon, or pedant. He was a man of ripe experience, a full man, one who could not be flattered, and one who could govern himself, as well as others. I further observed that he honored all who were true philosophers, without upbraiding the rest, and without being led astray by any. His manners were easy, his conversation delightful, but not cloying. He took regular but moderate care of his body, neither as one over-fond of life or the adornment of his person, nor as one who despised these things. Thus, through his own care, he seldom needed any medicines, whether salves or potions. It was his special merit to yield without envy to any who acquired any special faculty as either eloquence or learning in the law, in ancient customs, or the like. And he aided such men strenuously so that every one of them might be regarded 
and esteemed for his special excellence he observed carefully the ancient customs of his forefathers and preserved without appearance of affectation the ways of his native land he was not fickle and capricious and loved not change of place or employment after his violent fits of headache he would return fresh and vigorous to his wonted affairs of secrets he had few and these seldom and such only as concerned public matters he displayed discretion and moderation in exhibiting shows for the entertainment of the people in his public works in his largesses and the like and in all those things he acted like one who regarded only what was right and becoming in the things themselves and not the reputation that might follow after he never bathed at unseasonable hours had no vanity in building was never solicitous either about his food or about the make or colour of his clothes or about the beauty of his servants his dress came from Lorium, his villa on the coast, and was of Lanuvian wool for the most part. It is remembered how he used the tax collector Tusculum, who asked his pardon, and all his behaviour was of a piece with that. He was far from being inhuman, or implacable, or violent, never doing anything with such keenness that one can say he was sweating about it in all things he reasoned distinctly as one at leisure calmly regularly resolutely and consistently a man might fairly apply to him which is recorded of socrates that he could both abstain from and enjoy these things in want whereof many show themselves weak and in the possession intemperate to be strong in abstinence, and temperate in enjoyment, to be sober in both, these are qualities of a man of perfect and invincible soul, as was shown in the sickness of Maximus. To the gods I owe it, that I had good grandfathers and parents, a good sister, good teachers, good servants, good kinsmen and friends good almost all of them i have to thank them that i never through haste and rashness offended any of them though my temper was such as might have led me to it had occasion offered but by their goodness no such concurrence of circumstances happened as could discover my weakness I am further thankful that I was not longer brought up with my grandfather's concubine, that I retained my modesty, and refrained even longer than need have been from the pleasures of love. To the gods it is due that I lived under the government of such a prince and father as could take from me all vainglory, and convince me that it was not impossible for a prince to live in a court without guards, gorgeous robes, torches, statues, or such pieces of state and magnificence, but that he may reduce himself almost to the state of a private man, and yet not become more mean or remiss in those public affairs, wherein power and authority are requisite. I thank the gods that I have had such a brother as by his disposition might stir me to take care of myself, while at the same time he delighted me by his respect and love. I thank them that my children neither wanted good natural dispositions nor were deformed in body. I owe it to their good guidance that I made no greater progress in rhetoric and poetry and in other studies which might have engrossed my mind, had I found myself successful in them. By the God's grace I forestalled the wishes of those by whom I was brought up, in promoting them to the dignities they seemed most to desire. 
I did not put them off with the hope that since they were but young, I would do it hereafter. I owe to the gods that I ever knew Apollonius, Rusticus, and Maximus, and that I have had occasion often and effectually to meditate with myself and inquire what is truly the life according to nature. And as far as lies within the dispensation of the gods to give suggestion, help, or inspiration, there is nothing to prevent my having already realized that life. I have fallen short of it by my own fault, and because I give no heed to the inward munitions and almost direct instructions of the gods, to whom be thanks that my body hath so long endured the stress of such a life as I have led. By their goodness I never had to do with either Benedicta or Theodotus, and afterwards, when I fell into some foolish passions, I was soon cured. I give thanks that having often been displeased with Rusticus, I never did anything to him which afterwards I might have had occasion to repent, that though my mother was destined to die young, she lived with me all her latter years, that, as often as I inclined to succor any who were either poor or had fallen into some distress, I was never answered that there was not ready money enough to do it, that I myself never had need of the like succor from another. I must be grateful, too, that I have such a wife, so obedient, so loving, so ingenuous, that I had choice of fit and able men to whom I might commit the education of my children. I have received divine aids in dreams, in particular how I might stay my spitting of blood and cure my vertigo, which good fortune happily fell to me at Caeta. The gods watched over me, also when I first applied myself to philosophy, for I fell not into the hands of any sophist, nor sat poring over many volumes, nor devoted myself to solving syllogisms or stargazing. That all these things should so happily fall out, there was great need both for the help of fortune and for the aid of the gods. In the country of the Quadi, by the Granua. End of Book One. Book Two of the Meditations of the Emperor Marcus Aurelius Antoninus. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Meditations of the Emperor Marcus Aurelius Antoninus by Marcus Aurelius Translated by George Crystal, 1888-1944 Book Two Say this to yourself in the morning. Today I shall have to do with meddlers, with the ungrateful, with the insolent, with the crafty, with the envious and the selfish. All these vices have beset them because they know not what is good and what is evil. But I have considered the nature of the good and found it beautiful. I have beheld the nature of the bad and found it ugly. I also understand the nature of the evildoer, and know that he is my brother, not because he shares with me the same blood or the same seed, but because he is a partaker of the same mind and of the same portion of immortality. I therefore cannot be hurt by any of these, since none of them can involve me in any baseness. I cannot be angry with my brother, or sever myself from him, for we are made by nature for mutual assistance, like the feet, the hands, the eyelids, the upper and lower rows of teeth. It is against nature for men to oppose each other, and what else is anger and aversion? All that I am is either flesh, breath, or the ruling part. Cast your books from you, distract yourself no more, for you have not the right to do so. Like one at the point of death despise this flesh, this corruptible bone and blood, this network texture of nerves, veins, and arteries. Consider, too, what breath is, mere air, and that always changing, expelled and inhaled again every moment. The third is the ruling part. As to this, take heed, now that you are old, 
that it remain no longer in servitude, that it be no more dragged hither and thither like a puppet by every selfish impulse. Repine no more at what fate now sends, nor dread what may befall you hereafter. Whatever the gods ordain is full of wise forethought. The workings of chance are not apart from nature, and not without connection and intertexture with the designs of providence. Providence is the source of all things, and besides there is necessity and the utility of the universe, of which you are a part. For to every part of a being that is good which springs from the nature of the whole and tends to its preservation. Now the order of nature is preserved in the changes of the elements, just as it is in the changes of things that are compound. Let this suffice you, and be your creed unchangeable. Put from you the thirst of books, that you may not die murmuring, but meekly, and with true and heartfelt gratitude to the gods. Think of your long procrastination, and of the many opportunities given you by the gods, but left unused. Surely it is high time to understand the universe of which you are a part, and the ruler of that universe, of whom you are an emanation, that a limit is set to your days, which, if you use them not for your enlightenment, will depart as you yourself will, and return no more. Hourly and earnestly strive, as a Roman and a man, to do what falls to your hand with perfect unaffected dignity, with kindliness, freedom, and justice, and free your soul from every other imagination. This you will accomplish if you perform each action as if it were your last, without willfulness or any passionate aversion to what reason approves, without hypocrisy or selfishness, or discontent with the decrees of providence. You see how few things it is necessary to master, in order that a man may live a smooth-flowing, God-fearing life. For of him that holds to these principles, the gods require no more. Go on, go on, O my soul, to affront and dishonor thyself. The time that remains to honor thyself will not be long. Short is the life of every man, and thine is almost spent. Spent not honoring thyself, but seeking thy happiness in the souls of other men. Cares from without distract you. Take leisure, then, to add some good thing to your knowledge. Have done with vacillation, and avoid the other error. For triflers, too, are they who, by their activities, weary themselves in life, and have no settled aim to which they may direct, once and for all, their every desire and project. Seldom are any found unhappy from not observing what is in the minds of others, but such as observe not well the stirrings of their own souls must of necessity be unhappy. Remember always what the nature of the universe is, what your own nature is, and how these are related, the one to the other. Remember what part your qualities are of the qualities of the whole, and that no man can prevent you from speaking and acting always in accordance with that nature of which you are a part. In comparing crimes together, as, according to the common idea, they may be compared, Theophrastus makes the true philosophical distinction, that those committed from motives of pleasure are more heinous than those which are due to passion. For he who is a prey to passion is clearly turned away from reason by some spasm and convulsion that takes him unawares. But he who sins from desire is conquered by pleasure, and so seems more incontinent and more effeminate in his vice. Justly, then, and in a truly philosophical spirit, he says that sin, for pleasure's sake, is more wicked than sin which is due to pain. For the latter sinner was sinned against, and so driven to passion by his wrongs, while the former set out to sin of his own motion, and was led into ill-doing by his own lust. Do every deed, speak every word, think every thought, in the knowledge that you may end your days any moment. To depart from men, if there be really gods, is nothing terrible. The gods could bring no evil thing upon you. And if there be no gods, or if they have no regard to human affairs, why should I desire to live in a world void of gods and without providence? But gods there are, and assuredly they regard human affairs, and they have put it wholly in man's power that he should not fall into what is truly evil. And of other things, had any been bad, they would have made provision also, that man should have the power to avoid them altogether. 
for how can that make a man's life worse which does not corrupt the man himself presiding nature could not in ignorance or in knowledge impotent have omitted to prevent or rectify these things she could not fail us so completely that either from want of power or want of skill good and evil should happen promiscuously to good men and to bad alike now death and life glory and reproach pain and pleasure riches and poverty all these happen equally to the good and to the bad but as they are neither honourable nor shameful they are therefore neither good nor evil it is the office of our rational power to apprehend how swiftly all things vanish how the corporeal forms are swallowed up in the material world and the memory of them in the tide of ages such are all the things of sense especially those which ensnare us with pleasure or terrify us with pain or those things which vanity trumpets in our ears how mean how despicable how sordid how perishable how dead are they what are they whose opinions and whose voices bestow renown what is it to die your mind can tell you that did a man think of it alone and by close consideration strip it of its ghastly trappings he would no longer deem it anything but a work of nature to dread a work of nature is a childish thing and this is indeed not only nature's work but beneficial to her your reason tells you how man reaches god and through what part and what is the state of that part when he has attained unto him nothing says the poet is more miserable than to range over all things to spy into the depths of the earth and search by conjecture into the souls of those around us yet not to perceive that it is enough for a man to devote himself to that divinity which is within him and to pay it genuine worship and this worship consists in keeping it pure from every passion and folly and from repining at anything done by gods or men the work of the gods is to be reverenced for its excellence the works of men should be dear for the sake of the bond of kinship or pitied as we must pity them sometimes for their lack of the knowledge of good and evil and men are not less maimed by this defect than by their want of power to know white from black though you should live three thousand years or as many myriads yet remember that no man loses any other life than that which now lives nor lives any other than that which he is now losing the longest and the shortest lives come to one effect the present moment is the same for all men and their loss therefore is equal for it is clear that what they lose in death is but a fleeting instant of time no man can lose either the past or the future for how can a man be deprived of what he has not these two things then are to be remembered first that all things recur in cycles and are the same from everlasting and that therefore it matters nothing whether a man shall contemplate these same things for one hundred years or for two hundred or for an infinite stretch of time and secondly that he who lives longest and he who dies soonest have an equal loss in death the present moment is all of which either is deprived since that is all he has no man can be robbed of that which he has not beyond opinion there is nothing the objections to the saying of monimus the cynic are obvious but obvious also is the utility of what he said if one accept his pleasantry as far as truth will warrant it man's soul dishonours itself firstly and chiefly when it does all it can to become an excrescence and as it were an abscess on the universe to fret against any particular event is to revolt against the general law of nature which comprehends the order of all events whatsoever again it is dishonour for the soul when it has aversion to any man and opposes him with intention to hurt him as wrathful men do thirdly it affronts itself when conquered by pleasure or pain fourthly when it does or says anything hypocritically feignedly or falsely fifthly when it does not direct to some proper end all its desires and actions but exerts them inconsiderately and without understanding for even the smallest things should be referred to the end and the end of rational beings is to follow the order and law of the venerable state and polity which comprehends them all the duration of man's life is but an instant his substance is fleeting his senses dull the structure of his body corruptible the soul but a vortex 
we cannot reckon with fortune or lay our account with fame in fine the life of the body is but a river and the life of the soul a misty dream existence is a warfare and a journey in a strange land and the end of fame is to be forgotten what then avails to guide us one thing and one alone philosophy and this consists in keeping the divinity within inviolate and intact victorious over pain and pleasure free from temerity free from falsehood free from hypocrisy independent of what others do or fail to do submissive to hap and lot which come from the same source as we and above all with equanimity awaiting death as nothing else than a resolution of the elements of which every being compounded and if in their successive interchanges no harm befall the elements why should one suspect any in the change and dissolution of the whole it is natural and nothing natural can be evil at carnuntum end of book two Book Three of the Meditations of the Emperor Marcus Aurelius Antoninus. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Gemma. The Meditations of the Emperor Marcus Aurelius Antoninus by Marcus Aurelius. Translated by George Crystal, 1888 to 1944. Book Three. Man must consider, not only that each day part of his life is spent, and that less and less remains to him, but also that, even if he live longer, it is very uncertain whether his intelligence will suffice as heretofore for the understanding of his affairs, and for grasping that knowledge which aims at comprehending things human and divine. When dotage begins, breath, nourishment, fancy, impulse, and so forth will not fail him. But self-command accurate appreciation of duty, power to scrutinize what strikes his senses, or even to decide whether he should take his departure, all powers indeed which demand a well-trained understanding, must be extinguished in him. Let him be up and doing, then, not only because death comes nearer every day, but because understanding and intelligence often leave us before we die. Observe what grace and charm appear even in the accidents that accompany nature's work. Thus some parts of a loaf crack and burst in the baking, and this cracking, though in a manner contrary to the design of the baker, looks well and invites the appetite. Figs, too, gape when they are at their ripest, and in ripe olives the very approach to rotting adds a special beauty to the fruit. The droop of ears of corn, the bent brows of the lion, the foam at a boar's mouth, and many other things, are far from comely in themselves, yet since they accompany the works of nature, they make part of her adornment, and rejoice the beholder. Thus, if a man be sensitive to such things, and have more than common penetration into the constitution of the whole, scarcely anything connected with nature will fail to give him pleasure, as he comes to understand it. Such a man will contemplate in the real world the fierce jaws of wild beasts with no less delight than when sculptors or painters set forth for him their presentiments. With like pleasure will his chaste eyes behold the maturity and grace of old age in man or woman, and the inviting charms of youth. Many such things will strike him, things not credible to the many, but which come to him alone who is truly familiar with the works of nature and near to her own heart. Hippocrates, who had healed many diseases, himself fell sick and died. The Chaldeans foretold the fatal hours of multitudes, and afterwards fate carried themselves away. Alexander, Pompey, and Gaius Caesar, who so often raised whole cities and cut off in battle so many myriads of horses and foot, at last departed from this life themselves. Heraclitus, after his many speculations on the conflagration of the world, died swollen with water and plastered with cow dung. Vermin destroyed Democritus. Socrates was killed by vermin of another sort. What of all this? You have gone aboard, made your voyage, come to harbour. Disembark. 
If into another life, there will God be also. If into nothingness, at least you will have done with bearing pain and pleasure, and with your slavery to this vessel so much meaner than its slave. For the soul is intelligence and deity, the body dust and corruption. Waste not what remains of life in consideration about others, when it makes not for the common good. Be sure you are neglecting other work if you busy yourself with what such a one is doing and why, with what he is saying, thinking, or scheming. All such things do but divert you from the steadfast guardianship of your own soul. It behooves you, then, in every train of thought, to shun all that is aimless or useless, and, above all, everything officious or malignant. Accustom yourself so, and only so, to think that if any one were suddenly to ask you, of what are you thinking now? You could answer frankly and at once, of so and so. Then it will plainly appear that you are all simplicity and kindliness, as befits a social being who takes little thought for enjoyment or any phantom pleasure, who spurns contentiousness, envy or suspicion, or any passion the harbouring of which one would blush to own. For such a man, who has finally determined to be henceforth among the best, is, as it were, a priest and minister of the gods, using the spirit within him, which preserves a man unspotted from pleasure, unwounded by any pain, inaccessible to all insult, innocent of all evil, a champion in the noblest of all contests, the contest for victory over every passion. He is penetrated with justice, he welcomes with all his heart whatever befalls or is appointed by providence. He troubles not often or ever without pressing public need to consider what another may say or do or design, solely intent upon his own conduct, ever mindful of his own concurrent part in the destiny of the universe, he orders his conduct well, persuaded that his part is good. For the lot appointed to every man is part of the law of all things, as well as a law for him. He forgets not that all rational beings are akin, and that the love of all mankind is part of the nature of man. Also that we must not think as all men think, but only as those who live a life accordant with nature. As for those who live otherwise, he remembers always how they act at home and abroad, by night and by day, and how and with whom they are found in company, and so he cannot esteem the praise of such, for they enjoy not their own approbation. In action be neither grudging, nor selfish, nor ill-advised, nor constrained. Let not your thought be adorned with overmuch nicety. Be not a babbler or a busybody. Let the God within direct you as a manly being, as an elder, a statesman, a Roman, and a ruler, standing prepared like one who awaits the recall from life in marching order, requiring neither an oath nor the testimony of any man. And withal, be cheerful, and independent of the assistance and the peace that comes from others, for it is a man's duty to stand upright, self-supporting, not supported. If in the life of man you will find anything better than justice, truth, sobriety, manliness, and, in sum, anything better than the satisfaction of your soul with itself in that wherein it is given you to follow right reason, and with fate in that which is determined beyond your control. If, I say, you find aught better than this, then turn thereto with all your heart and enjoy it as the best that is to be found. But if nothing seems to you better than the divinity seated within you, which has conquered all your impulses, which sifts all your thoughts, which, as Socrates said, has detached itself from the promptings of sense and devoted itself to God and to the love of mankind, if you find every other thing small and worthless compared with this, see that you give place to no other which might turn, divert, or distract you from holding in highest esteem the good which is especially and properly your own. For it is not permitted to us to substitute for that which is good in reason or, in fact, anything not agreeable thereto, such as the praise of the many, power, riches, or the pursuit of pleasure. All these things may seem admissible for a moment, but presently they get the upper hand and lead us astray. 
but do you i say frankly and freely choose the best and keep to it the best is what is for your advantage if now you choose what is for your spiritual advantage hold it fast if what is for your bodily's advantage admit that it is so chosen and keep your choice with all modesty only see that you make a sure discrimination never esteem aught of advantage which will oblige you to break your faith or to desert your honour to hate to suspect or to execrate any man to play a part or to set your mind on anything that needs to be hidden by wall or curtain he who to all things prefers the soul the divinity within him and the sacred cult of its virtues makes no tragic groan or gesture he needs neither solitude nor a crowd of spectators and best of all he will live neither seeking nor shunning death whether the soul shall use its surrounding body for a longer or shorter space is to him indifferent were he to depart this moment he would go as readily as he would do any other seemly and proper action holding one thing only in lifelong avoidance to find his soul in any case unbefitting an intelligent social being in the soul of the chastened and purified man you would find nothing putrid foul or festering fate does not cut off his life before its proper end as one would say of an actor who left the stage before his part was ended or he that reached his appointed exit there remains nothing servile or affected nothing too conventional or too seclusive nothing that fears censure or courts concealment hold in honour the faculty which forms opinions it depends on this faculty alone that no opinion your soul entertains be inconsistent with the nature and constitution of the rational being it ensures that we form no rash judgments that we are kindly to men and obedient to the gods cast from you then all other things retaining these few remember also that every man lives only this present moment which is a fleeting instant the rest of time is either spent or quite unknown short is the time which each of us has to live and small the corner of the earth he has to live in short is the longest posthumous fame and this preserved through a succession of poor mortals soon themselves to die men who knew not themselves far less those who died long ago to these maxims add this other accurately define or describe everything that strikes your imagination so that you may see and distinguish what it is in naked essence and what it is in its entirety that you may tell yourself the proper name of the thing itself and the names of the parts of which it is compounded and into which it will be resolved nothing makes mind greater than the power to inquire into all things that present themselves in life and while you examine them to consider at the same time of what fashion is the universe and what is the function in it of these things of what importance they are to the whole of what to man who is a citizen of that highest city of which all other cities are but households consider what is this thing that now makes an impression on you of what it is composed and how long it is destined to endure consider also for what virtue it calls whether it be gentleness courage truthfulness fidelity simplicity independence or any other say therefore of each event this comes from god or this comes from the conjunction and intertexture of the strands of fate or from some chance or hazard of that kind or this comes from one of my own tribe from my kinsman from my friend he is indeed ignorant of what accords with nature but i am not and will therefore use him kindly and justly according to the natural and social law as to things indifferent i strive to appraise them at their proper value if you discharge your present duty with firm and zealous yet kindly observance of the laws of reason if you regard no by-gains but keep pure within you your immortal part as if obliged to restore it at once to him who gave it if you hold to this with no further desires or aversions and be content with the natural discharge of your present task and with the heroic sincerity of all you say or utter you will live well and herein no man can hinder you 
as surgeons have ever their knives and instruments at hand for the sudden emergencies of their art so do you keep ready the principles requisite for understanding things divine and human and for doing all things even the least important in the remembrance of the bond between the two for in neglecting this you will scant your duty both to gods and men cease your wandering for you are not like to read again your own memoirs or the deeds of the ancient greeks and romans or those collections from the writings of others that you laid up for your old age hasten then to your proper end fling away vain hopes and if you have any care for yourself fly to your own succour while yet you may men understand not all that is signified by the words to steal to sow to buy to rest to see what is to be done for it is not the bodily eye but another sort of sight that must discern these things we have body soul and intelligence to the body belong the senses to the soul the passions to the intelligence principles to be affected by the imagery of sense belongs to the beasts of the field no less than to us to be swayed by gusts of passion is common to us with the wild beasts with the most effeminate wretches with nero and with phalaris moreover the possession of a mind to guide us to what seems fitting is shared by us with the atheists with traitors to their country and with such as shut their doors and sin if then all the rest is common as we have seen there remains to the good man this special excellence to welcome with pleasure all that happens or is ordained not to defile the divinity enthroned in his breast not to perturb it with crowd of images but to preserve it in tranquillity and obey it as a god to observe truth in all he says and justice in his every action and though others may not believe that he lives thus in simplicity modesty and contentment he neither takes this unbelief amiss from any one nor quits the road which leads to the true end of life at which he ought to arrive pure calm ready to take his departure and accommodated without compulsion to his fate end of the third book Book Four of the Meditations of the Emperor Marcus Aurelius Antoninus. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Meditations of the Emperor Marcus Aurelius Antoninus by Marcus Aurelius. Translated by George Crystal. 1888. To 1944 book 4 the power which rules within us when its state is accordant with nature so acts in every occurrence as easily to adapt itself to all present or possible situations it requires no set material to work upon but under proper reservation needs but the incitement to pursue, and makes matters for its activities out of every opposition. Even so, a fire masters that which is cast upon it, and though a small flame would have been extinguished, your great blaze quickly makes the added fuel its own, consumes it, and grows mightier therefrom. Let no action be done at random, nor otherwise than in complete accordance with the principles involved. Men seek retirement in the country, on the sea coast, in the mountains, and you too have frequent longings for such distractions. Yet surely this is great folly since you may retire into yourself at any hour you please. Nowhere can a man find any retreat more quiet and more full of leisure than in his own soul, especially when there is that within it on which, if he but look, he is straightway quiet at rest. 
and rest i hold to be naught else but perfect order in the soul constantly therefore allow yourself this retirement and so renew yourself have also at hand thoughts brief and fundamental which readily may occur sufficing to shut out the discordant clamour of the world and to send you back without fretting at the task to which you return for at what do you fret at the wickedness of mankind recollect the maxim that all reasoning beings are created for one another that to bear with them is a part of justice and that they cannot help their sin remember how many of those who lived in enmity suspicion and hatred at daggers drawn have been stretched on their funeral pyres and turned to ashes remember and seize from your complaints is it your allotted part in the world's destiny that chagrins you be calm and renew your knowledge of the alternative that either providence directs the world or there is nothing but unguided atoms and recollect the many proofs that the universe is as it were a state do the ills of the body still have power to touch you reflect that the mind once withdrawn within itself once grown conscious of its own power has no concern with the motions rough or smooth of the breathing body remember too all that you have heard and assented to concerning pain and pleasure are you distracted by the poor thing called fame think how swiftly all things are forgotten behold the chaos of eternity which besets us on either side think how empty is the noisy echo of acclamation how fickle and how scant of judgment are they who would seem to praise us and how narrow the bounds within which their praise is confined all the earth is but a point in the universe how small a corner of that little is inhabited and even there how few are they and how little worth who are to praise us remember then that there ever remains for you retirement into the little field within and above all be neither distraught nor overstrained hold fast your freedom consider all things as a man of courage as a human being as a citizen as a mortal readiest among the principles to which you look let there be these two firstly things external do not touch the soul but remain powerless without and all trouble comes from what we think of them within secondly all things visible change in a moment and are gone for ever recollect all the changes of which you have yourself been a witness the world is a succession of changes life is but thought if mind be common to us all the reason in virtue of which we are rational is also common so too is the power which bids us to do or not do therefore we have all a common law and if so we are fellow citizens and members of some common polity the universe then must in a manner be a state for of what other common polity can all mankind be said to be members wherefore it is from this common state that we derive our intellectual power our reason and our law or whence do we derive them for that which is earthy in me is derived from earth my moisture from some other element my breath and what is warm or fiery from their proper sources and therefore as nothing can arise from nothing or return thereto my intellectual part has also a source death like birth is a mystery of nature the one a compounding of elements the other 
a resolution into the same. In neither is there anything shameful or against the nature of the rational animal or contrary to the law of its constitution. It is fate that such actions should come from such men. He who would have it otherwise would have figs without juice. This too you should remember, that in a very short time both you and he must die, and a little after not even the name of either shall remain. Suppress the thought, and the cry, I am hurt, is gone. Suppress, I am hurt, and you suppress the injury. What makes not a man worse than he was, makes not his life worse, nor hurts him without or within. The law of utility must act so. All that happens, happens right. You will find it so if you observe narrowly. I mean not only according to a natural order, but according to our idea of justice. And, as it were, by the action of one who distributes according to merit. Go on, then, observing this as you have begun, and whatever you do, let your aim be goodness. Goodness as it is rightly understood. Hold to this in every action. Think not as your insulter judges or wishes you to judge, but see things as they truly are. For two things be ever ready. First, to do that only which reason, the sovereign and legislative faculty, suggests for the good of mankind. Secondly, to change your course on meeting any one who can correct and alter your opinion. But let the change be made because you really believe it to be in the interest of justice or the public good, or such like, and not with any view to pleasure or glory for yourself. Have you reason? I have. Why then do you not use it? When it performs its proper office, what more do you require? You exist as part of a whole. You will disappear again in that which produced you, or rather, you will change and be resumed again into the productive intelligence. Many grains of frankincense are laid on the same altar. One falls soon, another later. It makes no difference. Within ten days, if you return to the observance of moral principles and to the cult of reason, you will appear a god to them who now esteem you a wild beast or an ape. Order not your life as though you had ten thousand years to live. Fate hangs over you. While you live, while yet you may, be good. How much he gains in leisure who looks not to what his neighbors say or do or intend, but considers only how his own actions may be just and holy, looking not, as Agathon says, to the moral example of others, but running a straight course and never turning therefrom. He who is careful and troubled about the fame which is to live after him considers not that each of those who remember him must very soon die himself, and thereafter also the succeeding generation, until every memory of him, handed on by excited and ephemeral admirers, dies utterly away. Grant that your memory were immortal, and those immortal who retain it, yet what is that to you? I ask not, what is that to the dead? But to the living, what is the profit in praise, except it be in some convenience that it brings? And you now abandon what nature has put in your power in order to set your hopes upon the report of others. Whatever is beautiful at all is beautiful in itself. Its beauty ends there. 
and praise has no part in it. Nothing is the better or the worse for being praised. And this holds also of what is beautiful in the common estimation, of material forms and works of art. Thus, true beauty needs nothing beyond itself, any more than law or truth or kindness or honor. For none of these gets a single grace from praise or one blot from censure. Does the emerald lose its virtue if one praise it or not? Can one, by scanting praise, depreciate gold, ivory, or purple, a liar, or a dagger, a flower, or a shrub? If our souls survive us, how, you ask, has the air contained them from eternity? How, I answer, does the earth contain so many bodies buried during so long a time? Just as corpses, after remaining for a while in the earth, change and are dissipated to make room for others, so also the souls, liberated into air, remain for a little and then are changed, diffused, rekindled, and resumed into the universal productive spirit, and so give way to others who come to take their places. This may serve for an answer on the supposition that the soul survives the body. But we have not merely to consider the number of bodies thus buried in the earth. There are also all the living creatures, eaten day by day by ourselves and other animals. How great a multitude of them is thus consumed, and, as it were, buried in the bodies of those who feed upon them, Yet there is ever space to contain them, owing to the changes into blood, air, and fire. What, then, is the key to this inquiry? Discrimination of matter and cause. Swerve not from your path. In every impulse, render justice its due, and in all thinking, be sure that you understand. I am in tune with all that is of thy harmony, O nature. For me nothing is too early, and nothing is too late that comes in thy good time. All is fruit to me, O nature, that thy seasons bring. From thee are all things, thou comprehendest all, and all returns to thee. The poet says, O oh, dear city of Sesrops, shall I not say, dear city of God? Do few things, says the philosopher, if you would have quiet. This is perhaps a better saying. Do what is necessary. Do what the reason of the being that is social in its nature directs. And do it in the spirit of that direction. By this you will attain the calm that comes from virtuous action, and that calm also which comes from having few things to do. Most things you say and do are not necessary. Have done with them, and you will be more at leisure and less perturbed. On every occasion, then, ask yourself the question, Is this thing not unnecessary? And put away not only unnecessary deeds, but unnecessary thoughts, for by doing so you will avoid all superfluous actions. Make trial how the life of a good man succeeds with you, the life of one who is content with the lot appointed him by providence, and satisfied with the justice of his own actions and the benevolence of his disposition. Have you seen the other state Make trial also of this. Avoid perplexity. Seek simplicity. Has a man sinned? He bears his own sin. Has aught befallen you? It is well, 
for all that befalls you is an ordained part in the weaving of the destiny of all things from the beginning in sum life is short make the best of the present in reason and in justice be sober in your relaxation the universe is either an ordered whole or a confusion but although a mixture of phenomena it is certainly an ordered whole or do you think that there can be order in you and confusion in the universe and that too in all things though diffused and separated are all in sympathy with one with another consider the deformity of these characters the black or malicious the effeminate the savage the beastly the childish the brutish the stupid the false the ribald the knavish the tyrannical he is a foreigner and not a citizen of the world who knows not what the world contains and he too who knows not what happens in it he is a deserter who flies from the reason that rules this polity he is blind whose intellectual eye is closed he is a beggar who needs the gifts of others and has not from himself all that is necessary from life he is an excrescence on the scheme of things who withdraws and separates himself from the reasoned constitution of the nature in which he shares by discontent with what befalls the same nature which produces this event produced thee he is the seditious citizen who separates his particular soul from the one soul of all reasonable beings one acts the philosopher without a coat another without books a third half naked says one i have not bread and yet i hold to reason says another i have not even the spiritual food of instruction and yet i hold to it love the art which you have learned humble though it be and in it find your recreation and spend the remainder of your life as one who with all his heart commits his concerns to the gods and neither acts the tyrant nor the slave to any of mankind recall for example the age of vespasian it is as the spectacle of our own time you will see men marrying bringing up children sick and dying warring and feasting trading and farming you will see men flattering obstinate in their own will suspecting plotting wishing for the death of others repining at fortune courting mistresses hoarding treasure pursuing consulships and kingdoms yet all that life is spent and gone come down to trajan's days again all is the same and again that life too is dead consider likewise the records of other times and nations and see how after their fit of eagerness all quickly fell and were resolved into the elements but most of all remember those whom you yourself have known men who were distracted about vain things men who neglected the course which suited their own nature neither holding fast to it nor finding their contentment there and herein forget not that care is to be bestowed upon any enterprise only in proportion to its proper worth for if you keep this in mind you will not be disheartened from over-concern with things of less account 
The familiar phrases of old days are now strange and obsolete, and likewise the names of such as were once much celebrated now sound strangely in our ears. Camillus, Caiso, Volesis, Leonatus, after them Scipio and Cato, lastly Augustus, Hadrian, and Antonine, all are forgotten. All things hasten to an end, shall speedily seem old fables, and then be buried in oblivion. This I say of those who have shone with the brightness of their fame. The rest of men, as soon as they expire, are unknown and forgotten. What then is it to be remembered for ever? A wholly empty thing. For what should we be zealous? For this alone, that our souls be just, our actions unselfish, our speech ever sincere, and our disposition such as may cheerfully embrace whatever happens, seeing it to be inevitable, familiar, and sprung from the same source and origin as we ourselves. Willingly resign yourself to Clotho, permitting her to spin her thread of what yarn she may. All things are for a day, both what remembers and what is remembered. Observe continually that all things exist in change, and keep this thought ever with you, that nature loves nothing more than changing what things now are, and making others like them. For what now is, is in a manner the seed of what shall be. Therefore conceive not that that alone is seed which is cast into the earth or the womb, for that is the thought of ignorance. You are presently to die, and yet you have not attained to simplicity or calm, or to disbelief that you can be hurt by things external. You have not learned to be kindly to all men, or to count just dealing the whole of wisdom. Scan closely that which governs men. See what are their cares, and what they pursue or shun. That which is evil for you exists not in the soul of another, nor in any change or alteration of the body which surrounds you. Where then is it? It lies in that part of you by which you apprehend what evil is. Stay the apprehension, and all is well. And though the poor body to which it is so closely bound be cut and burned, though it separate or mortify, yet let the apprehension remain inactive. That is, let it judge nothing, either good or bad, which can happen equally to the bad man and to the good. For that which befalls equally him who lives in accord and him who lives in discord with nature can neither be natural nor unnatural. Ever consider this universe as one living being, with one material substance and one spirit. Observe how all things are referred to the one intelligence of this being, how all things act on one impulse, how all things are concurrent causes of all others, and how all things are connected and intertwined. Thou art a poor soul, saddled with a corpse, said Epictetus. There is no evil for things which subsist in change, and there can be no good for things which subsist without it. Time is a river, a violent torrent of things coming into being. Each one, as soon as it has appeared, is swept away. It is succeeded by another which is swept away in its turn. All that happens is as natural and familiar as a rose in spring or fruit in summer. Such are disease and death 
calumny and treachery and all else which gives fools joy or sorrow consequence follow antecedents by virtue of a special and necessary connection this relation is not that which exists in a mere enumeration of independent things and depends merely on some arbitrary convention it is a rational relationship and just as things now existing are ranged harmoniously together so those which come into existence display no bare succession but a wonderful harmony with what preceded remember always the sayings of heraclitus that the death of earth is to become water the death of water to become air and the death of air to become fire and so conversely remember in what a case he is who forgets whither the way leads that men are frequently at variance with their close and constant companion the reason which rules all that men count strange that which they meet every day that we should neither act nor speak as though in slumber although even in slumber we seem to act and speak nor yet like children learning from their parents with a mere acceptance of everything just as we are told it if some god were to inform you that you must die to-morrow or the next day at farthest you would take little concern whether it was to be to-morrow or the next day that is if you were not the most miserable of cowards for how small is the difference wherefore account it of no great moment whether you die after many years or to-morrow constantly consider how many physicians are dead and gone who frequently knitted their brows over their patients how many astrologers who foretold the deaths of others with great ostentation of their art how many philosophers who wrote endlessly on death and immortality how many warriors who slew their thousands and how many tyrants who used their power of life and death with cruel wantonness as though they had been immortal how many whole cities if i may so speak are dead helis and pompeii and herculaneum and others past counting tell over next all those you have known one after the other think of how one buried his fellow then lay dead himself to be buried by a third and all this within a little time in sum look upon human things and behold how short-lived and how vile they are mucus yesterday to-morrow ashes or pickled carrion spend then the fleeting remnant of your time in a spirit that accords with nature and depart contentedly so the olive falls when it is grown ripe blessing the ground from whence it sprung and thankful to the tree that bore it be like a promontory against which the waves are always breaking it stands fast and stills the water that rage around it wretched am i says one that this has befallen me nay say you happy am i who though this has befallen me can still remain without sorrow neither broken by the present nor dreading the future the like might have befallen any one but every one would not have endured it unpained why then should we dwell more on the misfortune of the incident than on the felicity of such strength of mind can you call that a misfortune for a man which is not a miscarriage of his nature and can you call anything a miscarriage of his nature which is not contrary to its purpose you have learned its purpose have you not 
then does this accident debar you from justice magnanimity prudence wisdom caution truth honour freedom and all else in the possession of which man's nature finds its full estate remember therefore for the future upon all occasions of sorrow to use the maxim this thing is not misfortune but to bear it bravely is good fortune it is a vulgar meditation and yet very effectual for enabling us to despise death to consider the fate of those who have been most earnestly tenacious of life and enjoyed it longest wherein is their gain greater than that of those who died before their time they are all lying dead somewhere or other Cadicianus, fabius julian lepidus and their fellows saw the corpses of multitudes carried to their grave and then themselves were carried thither in sum how small was the difference of time spent painfully amid what troubles among what worthless men and in how mean a carcass think it not a thing of value rather look back into the eternity that gapes behind and forward into the other abyss of immensity compared with such infinity small is the difference between a life of three days and one of three ages like nestor's run ever the short way the short way is the way according to nature therefore speak and act according to the soundest rule for this resolution will free you from much toil and warring and from all artful management and ostentation end of the fourth book book five of the meditations of the emperor marcus aurelius antoninus this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org the meditations of the emperor marcus aurelius antoninus by marcus aurelius translated by george crystal eighteen eighty eight to nineteen forty four book five in the morning when you find yourself unwilling to rise have this thought at hand i arise to the proper business of man and shall i repine at setting about that work for which i was born and brought into the world am i equipped for nothing but to lie among the bedclothes and keep warm but you say it is more pleasant so is pleasure then the object of your being and not action and the exercise of your powers do you not see the smallest plants the little sparrows the ants the spiders the bees all doing their part and working for order in the universe as far as in them lies and you will refuse the part in this design which is laid on man will you not pursue the course which accords with your own nature you say i must have rest assuredly but nature appoints a measure for rest just as for eating and drinking in rest you go beyond these limits and beyond what is enough but in action you do not fill the measure and remain well within your powers you do not love yourself if you did you would love your nature and its purpose others who love the art that they have made their own exhaust themselves with laboring at it unwashed and unfed but you honor your own nature less than the carver honors his carving less than the dancer honors his dancing the miser his gold or the vain man his empty fame these men when desire takes them count food and sleep well lost if they can better realize the object of their longings and shall the pursuit of the common good seem less precious in your eyes and worthy of a lesser zeal how easy it is to thrust away and blot out each impression that is disturbing and unfit and forthwith to enjoy perfect 
tranquillity. Judge no speech or action unworthy of you which is consistent with nature. Be not dissuaded with any consequent criticism or censure from others, but if the speech or action be honorable, judge yourself worthy to say or do it. Those who criticize you have their own conscience and their own motives. Those you are not to regard, but follow a straight course, guided by your own nature and the nature of the universe, both of which point the same way. I walk the way which is nature's, until at last I shall fall and be at rest. Breathing out my breath into the air, wherefrom I daily drew it, falling on that earth whence my father drew his seed, my mother her blood, and my nurse the milk which nourished me, on that earth which has given me my daily food and drink through all these years, which sustains my footsteps and bears with me her manifold abuser. Men cannot admire you for your shrewdness. Be it so. But there is many another quality of which you cannot say, It is not in me. Display these. They are wholly in your power. Be sincere. Be dignified. Be painstaking. Scorn pleasure. Repine not at fate. Need little. Be kind and frank. Love not exaggeration and vain talk. Strive for greatness. Do you not see how many virtues you might show, of which you are yet content to fall short, though you have not the excuse that they are absent, or that you are unfit for them? Are you driven by some want in your equipment to be querulous, to be miserly, to be a flatterer, to reproach your body with your own faults? to cringe to others, to be vainglorious, to have all this restlessness in your soul? No, by the gods, you might have escaped these vices long ago. All your fault, then, is that you are somewhat slow and dull of comprehension. This you should strive to correct by exercise, neither neglecting your dullness nor taking a mean pleasure in it. Some men, when they have done you a favor, are very ready to reckon up the obligation they have conferred. Others, again, are not so forward in their claims, but yet in their minds consider you their debtor, and well know the value of what they have done. A third sort seem to be unconscious of their service. They are like the vine, which produces its clusters and is satisfied when it has yielded its proper fruit. The horse, when he has run his course, the hound, when he has followed the track, the bee, when it has made its honey, and the man, when he has done good to others, make no noisy boast of it, but set out to do the same once more, as the vine in its season produces its new clusters again. Should we then be among those who, in a manner, not know what they do? Assuredly. But this very thing implies intelligence, for it is a property of the unselfish man to perceive that he is acting unselfishly, and surely to wish his fellow also to perceive it. True, but if you misapprehend my saying, you will enter the ranks of those of whom I spoke before. They too are led astray by specious reasonings. But if you have the will to understand what my principle truly means— Fear not that in following it you will neglect the duty of unselfishness. This is a prayer of the Athenians. Rain, rain, dear Zeus, on the plains and ploughlands of the Athenians. Man should either not pray at all, or pray after this frank and simple fashion. Just as one says that Aesculapius had prescribed a course of riding for someone, or the cold bath, or walking barefooted, so it may be said that the guiding mind prescribes for a man disease 
or mutilation or losses or the like prescribed in the first case means that such treatment was enjoined on the patient as might coincide with the needs of his health in the second it means that each man's fortune is appointed to coincide with the purposes of fate now the very word coincidence implies something like that correspondence of squared stones in a wall or pyramid which workmen speak of when they fit them together in some structure all things are united in one bond of harmony and just as all existing bodies go to make the visible world what it is so destiny as the general cause is compounded of all particular causes the most unphilosophical grasp my meaning for they say fate gave this to so and so this was appointed or prescribed for him let us then receive the decrees of fate as we receive the prescriptions of Asclepius. he prescribes many things for us and some of them are harsh medicines yet we obey him gladly in the hope of health conceive therefore that for nature the doing of her work and the fulfilling of her purposes are as it were her health and welcome all that happens even should it seem hard fortune because it tends to the health of the universe and to the prosperity and felicity of zeus he would not have brought this or that on any man did it not contribute to the good of the whole nor does any part of nature's system bring aught to pass which suits not with her government for two reasons then you should content yourself with what befalls you the first is that it was created and ordained for you and was in a manner related to you from the beginning in the weaving of all destinies from the great first causes the second is that even what happens severally to each man contributes to the well-being and prosperity of the mind which governs all things and indeed even to its continued existence for the whole is maimed if you break in the slightest degree this continuous connection whether of parts or causes and this you are doing your best to break and to destroy whenever you repine at fate fret not neither despond nor be disheartened if it be not always possible for you to act according to your principles of perfection if you are beaten off return again to the effort and content yourself that your conduct is generally such as becomes a man love the good to which you return and come back to philosophy not as one who comes to a master but as one whose eyes ache recurs to sponge and egg as another has recourse to plasters or a third to fomentation and thus he will make no empty show of obeying reason but find that it gives you rest remember that philosophy demands no more than what your nature requires but you are wont to desire other things which accord not with your nature for what you say can be more delightful than such things is not this the very snare which pleasure sets for us yet consider if magnanimity frankness simplicity kindness and piety be not even greater delights and what is sweeter than wisdom itself when you are conscious of security and felicity in your powers of apprehension and reason the natures of things are so covered up from us that to many philosophers and these no mean ones all things seem incomprehensible the stoics themselves own that it is difficult to comprehend anything with certainty all our assent is inconsistent for where is the consistent man consider too the objects of our knowledge how transitory they are and how mean how often they are in the possession of the debauchee of the harlot of the robber review again the morals of your contemporaries it is scarcely possible to tolerate the best mannered among them not to say that the man can scarcely tolerate himself amid such darkness and filth 
in this perpetual flux of substance of time of motion and of things moved i can perceive nothing worthy of esteem or of desire on the contrary we should comfort ourselves as we await our natural dissolution and not be vexed at the delay but find rest in these thoughts first that nothing can befall us which is not in accord with the nature of all things second that it is always in our power not to do anything against the divine spirit within us to this no force can compel us to what end am i using my soul let me examine myself as to this on all occasions and consider what is passing now in that part of me which men call the ruler of the rest let me think too whose is the soul that i have is it a child's is it a youth's a timorous woman's or a tyrant's the soul of a tame beast or of a savage one of what value the things are which the many account good you may judge from this if a man has conceived certain things such as prudence temperance justice or courage to be good in the real sense he cannot while he is of this mind readily listen to the traditional jibe about a superabundance of good things it will not fit the case but when he has in mind things which seem good in the eyes of the multitude he is perfectly willing to hear and accept as quite appropriate the raillery of the comic poet thus even the ordinary mind perceives the difference for if this were not so we would not in the first case repudiate the jest as offensive nor would we salute it as a happy witticism when applied to wealth or to the opulence which produces luxury and ostentation proceed then and put the question whether these things are to be valued and esteemed good of which we have such an opinion that we may aptly say of their possessor he has so many possessions about him that he has no place wherein to ease himself i consist of a formal and a material element neither of these two shall die and fade into nothingness since neither came into being out of nothing every part of me then will be transformed and ranged again in some part of the universe that part of the universe will itself be transmuted into another part and so on for all time coming by some such change as this i came into being likewise my progenitors and so back from all time past there is no objection to this theory even though the world be governed by determined cycles of revolution reason and the art of thinking are powers which are complete in themselves and in their special processes they start from their own internal principle and proceed to their appointed end such mental acts are called right to indicate that the course of thought is right or straight nothing should be said to be part of a man which is not part of his human nature things that are not part of his essence cannot be required of him and have no part in the promise or the fulfilment of his nature therefore in such things lies neither the end of man nor the good which crowns that end moreover if anything were really part of a man it would not be proper for him to despise it or revolt against it nor would he be praiseworthy who made himself independent thereof if non-essential things were indeed good he could be no good man who stinted himself in the use of them but as we see the more a man goes without them and the more he endures the want of them the better a man he is the character of your most frequent impressions will be the character of your mind the soul takes color from its impressions therefore steep in it such thoughts as these 
wherever a man can live he can live well a man can live in a court therefore he can live well there again everything works towards that for which he was created and that to which anything works is its end and in the end of everything is to be found the advantage and the good of it now for reasoning beings society is the highest good for it has long since been proved that we were brought into the world to be social nay was it not manifest that the inferior kinds were formed for the superior and the superior for each other now the animate is superior to the inanimate and beings that reason to those that only live to pursue impossibilities is madness and it is impossible that the wicked should not act in some such way as this nothing can befall any man which he is not fitted by nature to bear the like events befall others and either through ignorance that the event has happened or from ostentation of magnanimity they stand firm and unhurt by them strange then that ignorance or ostentation should have more strength than wisdom material things cannot touch the soul at all nor have any access to it neither can they bend or move it the soul is bent or moved by itself alone and remodels all things that present themselves from without in accordance with whatever judgment it adopts within in one respect man is nearest and dearest to me in so far that is as i must do good to him and bear with him but in so far as some men obstruct me in my natural activities man enters the class of things indifferent to me no less than the sun the wind or the wild beast by these indeed some special action may be impeded but no interference with my purpose or with my inward disposition can come from them thanks to my acceptive and modifying powers for the mind can convert and change everything that impedes its activity into matter for its action hindrance in its work becomes its real help and every obstruction makes for its progress reverence that which is most excellent in the universe and the most excellent is that which employs all things and rules all likewise reverence that which is most excellent in yourself it is of the same nature as the former for it is that which employs all else that is in you and that by which your whole life is ordered that which harms not the city cannot harm the citizen apply this rule whenever you have the idea that you are hurt if the state be not hurt by this neither am i harmed and if the state be hurt we should not be wrathful with him who hurt it consider where lay his oversight consider frequently how swiftly things that exist or are coming into existence are swept by and carried away their substance is a river perpetually flowing their actions are in continual change and their causes subject to ten thousand alterations scarcely anything is stable and the vast eternities of past and future in which all things are swallowed up are close upon us on both hands is he not then a fool who is puffed up with success in the things of this world or is distracted or worried as if he were in a time of trouble likely to endure for long keep in mind the universe of being in which your part is exceedingly small the universe of time of which a brief and fleeting moment is assigned to you the destiny of things and how infinitesimal your share therein does another wrong me 
let him look to that his character and his actions are his own so much is in my present possession and is dispensed to me by the nature of things and i act as my own nature now bids me let the leading and ruling part of your soul stand unmoved by the stirrings of the flesh whether gentle or rude let it not commingle with them but keep itself apart and confine these passions to their proper bodily parts and if they rise into the soul by any sympathy with the body to which it is united then we must not attempt to resist the sensation seeing that it is of our nature but let not the soul for its part add thereto the conception that the sensation is good or bad live with the gods and he lives with the gods who continually displays to them his soul living in satisfaction with its lot and doing the will of the inward spirit a portion of his own divinity which zeus has given to every man for a ruler and a guide this is the intelligence the reason that abides in us all are you angry with one whose armpits smell or whose breath is foul what is the use his mouth or his armpits are so and the consequence must follow but you say man is a reasonable being and could by attention discern in what he offends very well you too have reason use your reason to move his instruct admonish him if he listens you will cure him and there will be no reason for anger you are neither actor nor harlot as you intend to live at your going so you can live here but if men do not permit you then depart from life yet so as if no misfortune had befallen you if my house be smoky i go out and where is the great matter so long as no such trouble drives me out i remain at my will and no one will prevent me from acting as i will and my will is the will of a reasonable and social being the intelligence of the universe is social it has therefore made the inferior orders for the sake of the superior and has suited the superior beings for one another you see how it hath subordinated and coordinated and distributed to each according to its merit and engaged the nobler beings to a mutual agreement in unanimity how have you behaved towards the gods towards your parents your brothers your wife your children your teachers those who reared you your friends your intimates your slaves can it be said that you have ever acted towards all of them in the spirit of the line he wrought no harshness spoke no unkind word recollect all you have passed through all that you have had strength to bear your life is now a tale that is told and your service is all discharged recall the fair sights you have seen the pleasures and the pains you have despised the so-called glory that you have foregone the unkindly men to whom you have shown kindness how is it that unskilled and ignorant souls disturb the skillful and intelligent what i ask is the skillful and intelligent soul it is that which knows the beginning and the end and the reason which pervades all being and by determined cycles rules the universe for all time in a little space you will be only ashes and dry bones and a name perhaps not even that a name is but so much empty sound and echo 
and the things which are so much prized in life are empty, mean, and rotten. We are as puppies that snap at one another, as children that quarrel, laugh, and presently weep again. But integrity, modesty, justice, and truth, up from the wide weighed earth, have soared to heaven. What, then, should detain you here? Things sensible are ever-changing and unstable. The senses are dull and easily deceived. The poor soul itself is a mere exhalation from blood. Fame is such a world as a thing of naught. What then? You await calmly extinction or transformation, whichever it may be. Until the fullness of the time be come, what is to suffice you? What else then a life spent in fearing and praising the gods, and in the practice of benevolence, toleration, and forbearance towards men? And whatsoever lies beyond the bounds of flesh and breath, remember that it is neither yours nor in your power. A prosperous life may be yours, if only you can take the right path, and keep to it in all you think or do. Two advantages are common to gods, to men, and to every rational soul. In the first place, nothing external to themselves has power to hinder them. In the second, their happiness lies in having mind and conduct disposed to justice, and in the power to make that the end of all desire. If the fault be not my sin, nor a consequence of it, if there be no damage to the common good, why am I perturbed about it? Wherein is the harm to the common good? Be not incautiously carried away by sentiment, but aid him that needs it according to your power and his desert. If his need be of the things which are indifferent, think not that he is harmed thereby, for so to think is an evil habit. But, as in the comedy, the old man begs to have his foster child's top for a keepsake, though he knows well that it is a top and nothing more, so should you act also in the affairs of life. You mount the rostra and cry aloud, O oh man, have you forgotten what is the real value of what you seek? No, but the many are keen in their pursuit of it. Are you then to be a fool because they are? In whatever case I had been left, I could have made my fortune. For what is it to make a fortune but to confer good things upon one's self? And true good things are a worthy frame of mind, worthy impulses, worthy actions. End of Book 5